Tarawalawa, I am Monte Beatham. You are watching One to Worry. And this man, my guest today, is Justin Morgan. Morg, Sam, how are you, man? I'm good. Thanks, Mont. Thanks for having me on. Awesome to have you on. Ten years of service to any organisation, yet alone a football club, is huge. Two years first as, as a player, and then eight years not out as a coach. Um, that's some contribution, man. How do you feel about that? Yeah, really proud. That's the first thing. Um, you know, I think I've said a number of times over the years that I've really had a real connection with this club. Um, I loved my time here as a player, and when I got an opportunity to come back and coach, it um, was fantastic. I've had a number of different roles, but uh, yeah, I really, really enjoyed it and made some great lifelong friends and love living in New Zealand. Let's go back two decades to get a glimpse of you in that Warriors jumper. Jones puts the kick in, and he'll score Morgan. This is Morgan. Cleary gives a pass across to Blackmore. Jones sees it open and tries to go through it and likes his pass. Just simply pops it up for Justin Morgan, who scores. No one there to get Justin Morgan. Morgs, mate, you came over, you had a job to do, and you did it, mate. Uh, what memories come to mind? Oh, just really grateful that I was here at the time when the club was rebirthing. Um, obviously, you know, we were thrown together in 2001, a real mixture of players, some, some seasoned campaigners, some high quality international players and a lot of young players. Uh, we had a new coach that never really coached first grade before. So um, yeah, it was great to be part of an organisation and get that early success. And, and I've said to the current group of players now that if you get some success, it's like nothing you'll ever experience. Um, you know, I cast my eye back in 2001, 2002, getting off the aeroplane, coming back to Auckland after winning games, winning, sem winning semi-finals, going to a grand final. Um, there's nothing like the experience when a Warriors team is doing well. Um, OK, so your perception of the Warriors um, on the other side of the ditch uh, before it was even the thought that you were coming over? Yeah, look, I always had a great admiration for a lot of Kiwi players. You know, Stephen Kearney was a favourite player of mine growing up. I was a big Western Suburbs fan um, and I loved the way he played. Uh, Mark Horro, when, uh, when he was at Parramatta, I was actually a ball boy at Parramatta in 89. <laughs> yeah, so I, I always had a really good affiliation with, uh, with Kiwi players and then... Obviously, um, you know, played in that first in Stacey Jones's debut, but I was playing yeah. for the opposition this time. Um, so, yeah, I, I really enjoyed um, the company of the Kiwi players. And when I saw that first game in '95, and I thought, well, wouldn't it be so cool to be part of it, part of something like that? And you know, a few years later, obviously, a uh, you know, hundred odd games later, I got a chance to come and play yeah. here. So I was very yeah. grateful for that. Let's go back to that debut game for Stacey Jones. Um, I mean, you scored the first points. Four points, what happened after that? Yeah, we didn't score any after that. So we got beat 40, <laughs> I think it was 40 to four. So I always kept telling him that I launched his career, you know what I mean? Because we played so poorly, he came on, starred, and he's gone on to be a Hall of Famer and, uh, you know, one of the greatest of all, if the, the greatest of yeah. all time, in my opinion, yeah. Was he on the tip sheet? Did you know much about him? Did you expect him to be such a superstar? Sort of, I knew a little bit about him because of the similar age um, and, and going through the sort of the junior grades. Um, but we'd, I'd heard about this young halfback from New Zealand and he wasn't real big, you know, and, you know, look, his career just, you know, took off. And, you know, I'm very fortunate enough. I got to play with him, as you Absolutely. did too, you know. And it's not until you retire and you go back and you go, well, I've got a chance to play. I've got a chance to play with Ruben Wickey. You've got a chance to play with Stacey Jones, Laurie Daly. You know, some superstars of the game. So, yeah, super grateful for those opportunities. Well, you mentioned Stacey, the opportunity to play alongside him and other uh, greats of the club early on. Uh, but that almost never happened because I think it was really late in the piece. And I'm picking it was Daniel Anderson. But you were over on the World Cup. Yeah, I was playing for Wales, uh, the World Cup. So that was a great experience. And then Daniel rang me. I knew, I'd known Daniel from um, school days. He'd coached yeah. me at school. Um, and he'd coached reserve grade at Parramatta when I, was, when I was still at Parramatta. And he rang me when I was at the World Cup. I was umming and ahhing about staying at Canberra and said, mate, I've got an opportunity to go to the Warriors. Would you like to, to, to come over? And I just jumped at it because mm. of those reasons that I already mentioned about, yeah. you know, I thought, what a great place to go. I'd never spent yeah. much time in Auckland. I thought, what a great place, what a great adventure and um, yeah, I'm super grateful that I took the opportunity that he rang me and uh, yeah, moved my family over and, and had a ball for two years. So what was the task given to you? What did you think you were coming to do as your role? Yeah, like Ando said to me, he said, look, you know, um, you're a seasoned NRL player now. You play NRL most weeks, 100-odd games. We've got some really good high-quality young players. Um, 
And, you know, you and a few other guys fell into that category, you know, and I, and I enjoy, I would have enjoyed that challenge of sort of going from that next step of being, you know, um, you know, the, you know, just a first grader yeah. to, you know, helping mentoring some of the younger players and, um, and we were, we were very lucky at the time. We had Ivan and Campo come at the same time. So we had a good group. And then guys like John Carlo, he was a seasoned you know, NRL player as well. So I enjoyed that role, but also enjoyed the challenge of you know, trying to compete with these younger players. You know, like guys like Jerry CUCU, you know, yeah. you know they, they were you know, super players. And, you know, like Jerry CUCU, you know, you couldn't have two contrasting people from the person that Jerry is and the player that Jerry is, mm. you know. Jerry, kind-hearted, humble, off the field, will give you the shirt on his back, crosses yeah. that white line. Scary. Whoa. <laughs> like, he used to scream at the opposition when he carried the football. Like, yeah. he scared me. Yeah. I was on yeah. his team. Were there any moments where you thought, oh, Jesus, this role's going to be harder than I thought? Not the role. I just thought, are we going to get enough players together? You know, I just thought <laughs> we're going to... Yeah, I thought we're going to have to get some players together. And um, I haven't seen a group of players with so many talented people in it in one organisation. Yeah. You know, so it was a real skill, I think, of, of Daniel and, and Kempe and the coaching staff to, to, you know, to get those young players and that athletic ability of them and get them to perform in the grind of the NRL. Mm. Because mm. to have a success for NRL season, it's a long grind. Yeah. You can have a great game here and there, but they got those guys to perform at an elite level for a long period of time. So, um, yeah, there was a couple of moments I thought, wow. But I, <laughs> but the, I kept coming back to the point that, you know, there's some real talent here. Mm. And if we can just get them together, we'll be fine. And some talent came with you as well. Um, some of the club legends, um, you know, played in the grand final uh, the following year. Uh, let's go through them and, and your thoughts on them. Uh, Kevin Campion first. Oh, toughest man I've ever played with. Like to the point where I was so glad he was on my team. Yeah. You know, like he, he just run through a brick wall. Um, and you know, still now I just look at him and go, wow, he's a tough human being. If I was the tenth of as tough as him, <laughs> I'd be happy. Yeah. Uh, okay, the gorilla, uh, Richard Villasanti. Oh, I, my locker was next to the big villa, yeah. so um, you know, villa was. You know, he often embellished a few stories here and there. He's a great storyteller. Always GST. Always, Always GST. GST on top and then some. So I used to, I used to love uh, chatting with. Big Villa, he, you know, tell me what he did on the weekend and, you know, I used to shrug the shoulders, but I used to love training with him. You know, he was a hard trainer, you know, he worked really hard on the rowing machine, you know, we, you know whether it be in the gym, so, uh, and again, just a super aggressive player, and I just loved having those aggressive players around me. I, I used to say to people, they said, why did you retire so young? I said, mate, I had to tackle Villa, Jerry CUC, Arwen Guttenbill, you know, yep. Paliasina, all these guys. And the Sandpit. Every day. I said, you only have to tackle them once a year when you play against yeah. them. I had to tackle them every, every day. So, yeah, in the sandpit too, especially if you miss so many tackles. I mean, Stacey and I were talking about the, the other day and he kept yeah. saying, I used to miss four or five tackles. I used to go up to the sandpit. I said, yeah, well, I used to have to go up to the sandpit because I was a forward. I didn't miss many tackles, but I still had to tackle them. <laughs> Absolutely. And yeah. one guy that wasn't big in stature, not so aggressive, but, geez, he was fast. Uh, Murph, Justin Murphy. Oh, Murph, you know, again, um, Murph... Tooks, myself and Dave Miles, we yeah. all played cards together on the plane on the way over all the time. So got a great um, friendship with Murph. Um, and again, just, you know, when he got his opportunity, he was a speed machine, you know, like mm. just so mm. fast and um, pretty good card player too, you know. So, uh, yeah, we had plenty of battles over the years. Let's, let's talk about Tooks a little bit more because did you play with him at Parramatta? I mean, yeah, I did, yeah. He was yeah. a great player and, I mean, you... You wouldn't have known uh, at the time or when he left to come here, you wouldn't have known that you were following soon after. Uh, Big Tooks. Yeah, he's a champion, Big Tooks. You know, um, you know, got some great stories. He was my roomie as well. You know, I moved, when I moved over, I lived with him for a little while. And, um, yeah, we all know Tooks sort of struggled a little bit on the weight category sometimes, you know. So, yeah, we, yeah, we made a little bit of a pact, you know, we need to do this, need to do that. And, you know, he worked so hard, Big Tooks. Yeah. You know, he worked yeah. really hard and a very likeable guy. And super skillful. He doesn't get the credit for being so... For for being so skillful. He uh, he made a great line break. Um, might have been against the Cowboys, yep. you know, and yeah, he had a great soft touch. He was a little bit like me, you know, um, thought he was a halfback, but he was in the wrong shaped body, you know. So yeah, I enjoyed my time with Tooks and, and it was it was sort of this, the start of Brent Webb's career. And he come over, yeah. I think he yeah. played in Queensland, yeah. maybe in the Queensland Cup that sort of, yeah. you know, brought him over. He's only, you know, a small guy too, Webby. Yeah. And uh, he came over and, you know. Maybe that's why he kept taking his shirt off. Yeah. So it proves to everyone that he'd 
wasn't such a small guy. <laughs> well, he wasn't sure. It was small when he took his shirt off. You know, he was strong. I remember bugger. one day he got onto a massage bench and um, he took took a shirt off, but he jumped on and goes, "Ah, oh, calves and hammies, please." So, so what did you take your shirt off for? But well, anyway, that's Brent Webb. Um, beast two, 160 um, oh, kilos. Oh, so strong. Uh, some highlights. Um, and I remember that game we were down in Wellington, um, 16 points in five minutes. Um, yeah. And you know, some could say it was because of your uh, great run behind uh, the back of the ruck and coming through with that line break, mate. Uh, what do you mean by that at that moment in that game? And, and just that's what the team would do, right? They could just back themselves and come from anywhere. Well, that's what we did, didn't we? Like, and I think that was a great characteristic of the team that wouldn't matter what the scoreline was, we mm. believed that we could win. You know, because we had so many high quality players. I, I remember I used to say to, you know, jokingly to some people, if we're behind, just pass the ball to Ali and then he'll pass it to Toops and we'll score. Do you yeah. know what I mean? Yeah. So um, it might have been Richie Blackmore that played the ball, but it was a fast play the ball. So I got yeah. a little bit of yeah. ruck speed and I didn't make many line breaks. And I always joke with Stace now because I think Stace, uh, we ended up having a draw. And I said, mate, that could have been my moment of glory. Like, I, I, I couldn't have made the back page of a paper he, ever. He's still angry at Logan because <laughs> as soon as that trial was That's scored, right. Was two, Logan's been over him straight and goes, Stace, Stace, take, take your time. Your time miss, take your miss, time. Miss. And what do you do? Yeah. You, you, you get in that situation. Not that he would have been thinking about that, but it was, it was a tired game and uh, that's what happened. That first year, 2001, from a coach's point of view now, from having been on the ground, being a big, vital part of the team, what do you think was the key in, in us getting to that 2001 final series? I think I think it was the camaraderie that we we had to naturally build. I think um, I think everybody that came to the club in 2001, whether they were a seasoned you know international, and there was a few of those, you know, um, but everybody had a little bit of a point to prove. You know, those younger players. You know, myself. You know, I wanted to go on and continue on. I played 100 games. I wanted to you know get to that next level, and I think everybody that came in 2001 was highly driven. They, whether it was a personal reason that they wanted to succeed or they wanted to prove a club wrong because they got let go or whatever it was, yes. I just felt that that was, a, that was one of the, the defining characteristics that really tied us all together. And then, like anything, you start to win games and all of a yeah. sudden the belief starts to grow. Yes. And, and it, yeah, it, was just, it was just a fun time. You know, yeah. It was a fun time to be at the club. Uh, OK, so we snuck up on everyone in 2001, made the playoffs for the first time in the club's history. But after a disappointment in the Parramatta game, um, 2002, expectation, um, pressures. Morgan, if you could bottle what happened throughout 2002 in terms of what was special uh, to just you know, have that chemistry, what, what, what do you think it would be? Again, the belief that we had, mm. the belief. And that's a hard thing to coach, you know, to coach confidence into a team is very hard. But we had that in abundance. You know, we went on a huge run there of, of games in a row and it wouldn't matter what the score was or who was out there, who was playing, we felt that we could win. Um, while it, like, oh, I didn't play in the grand final, but I was absolutely shattered that we got beat, you know. And I think if that group had another shot, at it all together because there's naturally yeah, changes yeah. after yeah. 2002. If we would have had another shot, I think that would have driven us maybe to the next level of mm. possibly getting it. So you mentioned didn't play in the grand final because that's the reality of sport. Like you've done a great job throughout the whole season, played in pretty much every game, played really well. Uh, the disappointment of not being in the grand final because I was there as 18th man, I had a knee injury, didn't come back, didn't push it. But I guess, did you even? push your chance for selection with I, I did and I wanted to go with a bit more of a you know powerful pack and some yeah. punch off the bench which you know that wasn't my strength I knew mm. that I understood you know and he explained to me the reasons behind his selection didn't agree with him naturally because no, you know, I wanted to play um, and obviously we have a family connection his brother is married to my sister so you know we sort of stay in yeah. touch that way and I always give him a hard time. I say to him, have you won an NRL grand final? And he said, no, no, I haven't. I said, well, I haven't played in one either. I said, so maybe if the reverse happened, you would have picked me for the grand final. You might have <laughs> won one. But it didn't, it didn't um, make me feel any less part of the team. I knew that mm. at the end of that year that I was going to retire. Um, yeah. And he sort of gave me the opportunity, you know, he said, you're not going to get selected for the grand final. Um, you know, you can be in and around the team, which I was, 
um, and then wasn't 18th man, you know, chose not to because it was, you know, the last yeah. game and thought it was a better opportunity for somebody else that was going to possibly mm. be at the club and get a bit of experience from it. So, um, yeah, I watched from the stands like everybody else. Um, it was equally upset like everybody else, you know, mm. when, when we uh, when we got beat. So certainly not disappointed, you know. Yeah. I, I've still felt that I made a major contribution. I would have loved to have played in a grand final. Like every player would have loved yeah. to have played in a grand final, but still very, felt very much part of the group. What was across those two years your favourite games as a player? Uh, again, I didn't play, but the Sharks playoff game, yeah. you know, um, which, is a, which, which is a massive game for the club. And any time that we played the Broncos, you know, mm. I just, I don't know, I always felt that because the Broncos was the first game that we played as a club, yeah. I thought we always seemed to lift ourselves a little bit for those games and they were still, you know, at that time, a superstar club. We just loved playing against them. And I put that down to also Daniel Anderson because, mm. like, he'd get to us and he'd say we knew that they were the Yardstick, but it was always... He always used to say that they were old and they're over the hill and you've got to show them, but they weren't very old and they weren't over the hill, but yeah. they were still the pinnacle. Uh, so, you know, maybe before his time in terms of uh, getting in that top two inches. Yeah, and you're 100% right. You've got to instill belief. Yeah. you know, in your team. You have to uh, make them believe that they're good enough to beat whoever you put in front of them. And I think that was the biggest thing and there was a sort of a, I suppose, a bit of a light bulb moment for me with coaching. I, I initially thought coaching was about knowledge and having the mm. most knowledge and, you know, having the best plays and all that type of thing. But I learnt very quickly that it wasn't about that. It was about instilling belief in your in your team and your players and, and also getting the best out of your players. Uh, the players that you loved throughout those two years that you'd love to coach and why you loved them? Uh, look, I think I would have loved to have coached Ali Lawatiti just to have that weapon of player, yeah. you know. Um, and he was just so relaxed, you know. Like, he, he just was he was just so cruisy through training, mm. cruisy through life, you know. And I just would have loved to have been able to, you know, have, have that player. Francis Melli's another player I would have loved mm. to have coached. I really admired him, like, when I played with him. But then he went to the Super League with Daniel St. Helens and absolutely yeah. killed it over there. And, again, I just felt as though that what he did on the field was quite infectious to everybody mm. else when he made one of yeah. those big runs or big hit or something like that. Um, I didn't think you were going to be a coach. I knew you always had the ability and you could talk. Uh, <laughs> that was great. Did you think you were going to be a coach early on? Was it in your in your thought process? Oh, not really, to be honest, Mons. I didn't know what I wanted to do. The way my coaching came about, I knew I was retiring, so I just sent out a blanket email to a lot of people yeah. saying, look, I'm looking for opportunity, people that know me. Um, and Taz Batiri got in contact with me and said, look, Toulouse are looking for a player coach in France. Mm. Then we spoke to Daniel about it. Daniel said, man, I think, you know, you communicate quite well. You've got a reasonable yeah. knowledge of the game. Um, just give it a go. And a little bit like I said earlier, I thought, well, if I'm going to give it a go, I might as well just jump feet first straight mm. in, bang, see if I'm any good at it. Go to a foreign country where I don't speak the language, mm. work with players that, uh, that, yeah, aren't, yeah, that aren't elite and see, and if you still love it at the end of that, yeah. maybe it's a career for you. And I got over there, I started playing. Um, I realised I retired because I didn't like playing anymore. Mm. So I, after about six or seven games, my last game playing was against Wathbrow Hornets in the Challenge Cup and just went straight into full-time mm. coaching after that and really enjoyed it. 20 years is a great career and as a coach, um, and that's impressive. It's it's actually huge. Yeah, I feel as a coach, if you make a contribution to a player's career, it's a little bit like a senior player. When you mm. feel as though that you've helped along the journey a little bit, you get a great deal of satisfaction out of that. And then if you can help build a team and build a club and, you know, and when you leave that organisation and you see some of the things that they're doing and that you helped implement, um, it makes you very proud, you know. And I've changed a lot as a coach over the last 20 years. I've been coaching over 20 years now and, you know, I've changed a lot, you know, um, hopefully for the better. And, and I think it's one of those industries and one of those jobs that evolves all the time yeah. for a few different reasons. One, your maturity level changes. Um, experiences change you as well. Winning and losing changes you yeah. as, a, as a human. But also the people that you coach change. You know, the personality of players now is very different to what it was 10 years ago and mm -hmm. a hell of a lot different to what it was 20 yeah. years ago. Yeah. And you have, to, you have to adapt to that. You know, if I was to try to coach now like I coached 20 years ago, no. you know, it just, it just wouldn't be effective, you know. And, and likewise, 
hopefully I'm still coaching in another 10 years time that, you know, that I evolve and develop mm. and, and continue to grow as a coach, you know, and you can only do that when you work with other high quality yeah. coaches and, you know, and players. And I've been fortunate enough to do that. Relationship with Webby. I mean, you had him underneath you in a great career, 178 games for Hulk AR. Then mm. you came back as assistants mm. to New Zealand Warriors. How did you come home and how did you find that, that process of you both being assistants in the Warriors jumpers? Yeah, it was, um, I always had a huge amount of time for Webby. Um, when he first came over, to the UK, I was coaching his brother and his brother said, oh, look, Andrew wants to do some coaching. Can you come along and help out? And, you know, super enthusiastic. And yeah, he's done the graft. He's done the graft, you know. He coached an under 20s team over there for whole KR that trained in the car park. You know, and he had to do security at the stadium to earn enough money and that kind of thing. And a lot of my success over in England was down to Webby. You know, he's uh, he complimented me as a coach, and um, and and it was a great opportunity. I know when he came to the Warriors, um, I spoke to Cappy at the time. You know, he said, oh, "I'm thinking about bringing Webby here. What do you think?" I said, "Mate, great coach. You know, mm-hmm. you're not going to mm-hmm. go wrong there with him." And we had a we had a great relationship. And when I got an opportunity to stay here, working underneath him, um, again, you know, the, the dynamics different, but it's you yeah. know, I think in any organisation, if there's a element of respect, which there certainly is there. Um, you know, that's when you grow together and, and that's what I feel we're doing at the moment. So a lot of my success in the UK was down to, you know, what Webby did for me. So hopefully I can return the favour for him. Morgs, as a coach, it's, um, you know, it's some privileged work. You really help shape people. Is there a project there or, or someone that you've enjoyed and you're seeing them flourish right now? Um, Marcelo Montoya. You know, um, I really love seeing his progress as a player. You know, he came to us in Kayama um, when we had that split preseason, and uh, Mars has worked so hard on his game. I've really enjoyed watching him develop. And Ed Cossey's another one. You know, Ed Cossey, um, he's had some bumps along the way, you know, um, but he bounces back and he always comes to training and wants to get better. So they're, they're two that are they're really pretty close to my heart, seeing them uh, seeing them progress over the last couple of years. It's funny how you get a man or a pig in the middle of the field looking after wingers, mate. You've changed walls. <laughs> I know. I know. I can't believe it. A wonderful career in both, mate. Um, what did you feel more like, a player or a coach? I think because more recently a coach, but you never can substitute playing. You know, you can never substitute the feeling of playing and the feeling that you get with your teammates. We have a connection with the players as mm. coaches and we have a connection with each other as coaches, but there's no connection like a player-to-player mm. connection. Coaching's way more nerve-wracking because you feel helpless on game day. You know, all your work's done Monday to Friday. And, and as a player, you just have to worry about yourself. You just have to worry about getting yourself right, your own performance. As a coach, you've got so many different variables, different players at different stages of their career, different mindsets, different forms. Some are in really good form, some are in poor form. And you have to adapt what information you feed them. Because again, when I first started coaching, I thought more is better. Just give them everything. But some players can't absorb all that information. It makes their performance worse. So it's not until you gain some experience from coaching that you realise that, okay, I need to pull a little bit back with this player or I need to just maybe not talk technical with him. Maybe I just got to see how he's travelling off the field because that's more important to some players than than footy and you have to accept that. When you're able to contribute to a club the way you have uh, the last 10 years, a decade and not out still going at the club, how would you want to be a but when your time's up? Oh, just that I made a contribution. You know, I just want people to say, yeah, you know, he tried hard for me. Um, I'm not done yet. I want to make sure that we win a grand final because I haven't done that yet. I haven't won a grand final. I didn't win one as a player. And there'd be no more rewarding f- um, feeling than winning a premiership for this club, the first mm. one of all time. Mm. And like nobody will be able, to be able to take that away from you if you're part of that organisation when that happens. So that's, that's the goal. Absolutely. And we will love you if, uh, when, mm. when that happens. Uh, once a warrior, always a warrior. Ten years of great service to a club, mate. We thank you for your time on the field and off the field as a great coach. Thanks, Mons. Great being on and uh, thank you very much. I'm Mons Beatham. I'll see you next week for another episode of Once a Warrior. Puts the kick in, and he'll score Morgan. To Morgan. Cleary gives a pass across to Blackmore. Jones sees it open and tries to go through it and lights his pass. Just simply pops it up for Justin Morgan, who scores. No one there to get Justin Morgan. Woo!